All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MOS Live, our virtual planetarium, The Sky Tonight. My name is Becca, my pronouns are she and her, and today I'm going to be your moderator, which means that I will be looking at any questions and sharing them with our educator. Now, if you're joining us on Zoom and would like to ask any questions at any point, you can type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And if you're joining us on Zoom and would like to see closed captions, you can click on the closed captions button and uh, click show subtitles. If you're joining us on Facebook and YouTube, thank you very much for being here. Unfortunately, we will not be able to see your questions or comments at this time, but we are very excited that you're joining us and hope that you enjoy. So with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to our lead educator and have her introduce herself. Hi, everybody. My name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns. And as Becca said, I'm going to be your presenter today talking about some things you're going to be able to that are going to be up in the sky tonight. And to do this, I'm going to be using a program called Stellarium. It's a free open source program that you can download and use yourself or use on the web if you feel like if you don't feel like downloading it. So here it is. I have it set for um, five o'clock tonight. So right at five o'clock, we are looking towards the Western horizon. So um, that's what that W is. We got Northwest over here. We have Southwest over here. And this glow right here is the sun, which is just at the horizon because sunset tonight in Boston is going to be at 5.03. And I'm very excited because we're actually gonna gain quite a lot of daylight over the course of the month of February. Of course, the shortest day of the year was the first day of winter back on December 21st. And the length of day has been getting bigger and bigger, longer and longer um, ever since then. But it gets longer at different rates. So right around the solstice, we only gain a couple of seconds of daylight each day. This is the part of the year where we're gaining the most daylight each day, over two minutes of daylight per day, which doesn't sound like a lot. But over the course of a month, we're actually gaining over an hour of daylight. So sunset... Uh, we're gaining, I think, from February 1st to February 28th, about an hour and 10 minutes of daylight. Compare that to January, which is a longer month. From January 1st to January 31st, we only gained about 50 minutes. So even though February is a shorter month, we're gaining 20 more minutes of daylight in February than we did in uh, January. So by the time we get to the end of February, sunset's going to be after 5.30, which is pretty awesome. So here it is. It's um, five o'clock. The sun has just set. And like I said, in by the end of the month, sunset is going to be at 530. So just as a comparison, if I make it 530 now, the sky is already starting to get a little dark. That's today on February 5th. If you go look at the sky on February 28th, at this time, the sun will still be above the horizon. I always just like to remind myself that the days are in fact getting longer because I get a little tired of these cold, dark days. And tonight, right after 5.30, there's something kind of interesting that's happening. Uh, if you look, you'll be, you know, watching the sky. And then right around 5.34, 5.35, this thing appears on the western horizon, close to, very close to northwest, this absurdly bright object. And I'm going to go ahead and fast forward time a bit because you're going to notice something a little different. It's rising from the west. This very, very bright object is rising from the west. If there's one thing we talk about here on this star show, it's that things rise in the east and they move across the sky and they set in the west. This very bright object is not doing that. So, and it's also, it's really very, very bright. So, my friends watching at home, what do you think this is? This very, very bright object that tonight, or a little after 5.30, is going to rise from the west and move across the sky and eventually set in the east. And if you're not sure, you can put question marks, because if you're not sure, it's very important to know that you don't know and to be willing to say it. That's a very important part of science. So we have a few guesses coming in. So far, a few people have said maybe it's a star. Um, we have 
guesses for maybe a planet like Mercury or Venus. We definitely have some question marks, some I don't knows, and we do have one guess here for the space station. These are all excellent guesses because everything you've said is something that appears bright in the sky. But that's the, the, the trick here is that this thing is rising from the west and setting in the east and it's moving so quickly. Here, I'm going to go ahead and let time move forward at its normal pace. This is just time moving at its normal pace and you can see this thing moving. So whatever this is, is moving quite quickly. And like I said, rising in the west and setting in the east. Stars, planets, they can be very, very bright. In fact, Venus is one of the brightest things that appears in the sky, but they all rise in the east and they move with the sky and they set in the west. So what we have here is not a natural object. This is in fact the International Space Station, the third brightest object in the sky. This is why whenever I talk about Venus, I always have to say it's the third brightest natural object in the sky after the sun and the moon, because the ISS is actually brighter. It's going to be, we've got a really high pass happening at 5.30 tonight. Uh, usually it does not go this high. It's going to go almost straight up over us. Usually you see it more at an angle to the north or the south. We are going to be passing, or rather the space station is going to be passing almost directly over Boston tonight. And like I said, it's a ridiculously bright object. It moves visibly. You can see it moving across the sky again. This is, I'm not fast forwarding time. This is how fast it's going to be moving across the sky. And Right now, there are seven people aboard that space station, four American astronauts, one Japanese astronaut, and two Russian cosmonauts actually living aboard the space station, including uh, those who launched aboard the first of um, SpaceX's commercial spacecraft to carry NASA astronauts to the space station, which is kind of exciting. And this space station has been a huge part of the space program for over 20 years now. It's been continuously populated for 20 years. There have been, for the last 20 years, there has always been people who were not on Earth. Um, I get very excited when I talk about the space station. <laughs> it's really a remarkable achievement. Uh, it is a cooperative effort from, I think, 14 different countries. It's really quite uh, an astounding thing that it exists. And you can spot it very easily from the sky, from the ground when it goes overhead because it is so very bright. So rising from the west at a, just after 5.30, and then it's going to take about seven minutes to cross the sky that first time. Now here's the thing. When you have a uh, an ISS pass like this in the early, early evening, what's happening is it's getting dark here on the ground but up a couple hundred miles up where the space station is, there's still a lot of sunlight and it's the sun reflecting off the space stations, mostly off of its bright um, solar panels that gives it that, bright, that brightness. It makes it so easy to see. And I said that the space station is moving pretty quickly because it is, it has to, to stay in orbit. But what that means is that it only takes about 90 minutes for it to orbit the Earth. So very frequently, when you see an ISS pass like this, you can actually catch another one roughly 90 minutes later, a little more than 90 minutes, because the Earth does rotate a little bit during that time. And that means if we have one pass happening at just after 5.30, a right around 7.10, it's actually about 7, 7 11, there, somewhere thereabouts, it appears again. This one's a much lower pass. It's not going to be going directly over Boston this time. It's going to be passing to the south of Boston. Much harder to see, but this is what frequently happens. Not always, but often if you get one ISS pass, you will often get a second visible ISS pass. So I know it's kind of cloudy out right now, you might not be able to see these passes as they happen tonight, but the thing is, this isn't a rare event. So it's not an every night event, but it's also not rare. There's a website you can go to called Spot the Station, 
And it's a great way to go and look up where you are and see if there's going to be any visible passes by the ISS over your location for up to the coming week. So although we may not be able to see these, may not clear up enough for us to be able to see these two passes happening tonight, like I said, this is not a rare thing. So you can go ahead and spot the station the next time it's overhead, wherever you are. And like I said, this second pass, it's not going to be going as high and it's not going to be up as long. It's only gonna be up for about three minutes. And we do have, um, if you don't mind, a few quick questions about looking for the space station. Um, we have questions about how far away from Boston will it be visible? And specifically, can we see it from Orleans Mass, which is on the Cape? Yes. So if it's going to be visible in Boston, it's going to be visible pretty much from anywhere in uh, Massachusetts especially that first pass. The higher it is over Boston, the easier it will be to see from anywhere in Massachusetts. That second pass where it's pretty far to the south of Boston, it would be harder to spot the further north you get. But usually Boston's pretty central in terms of latitude for Massachusetts. So if you can see it from Boston, odds are you're gonna be able to see it from anywhere in Massachusetts. But again, spot the station allows you to input anywhere um and check in any location and check and see if there's going to be a visible pass from that spot are there any other questions becca before we head on sure so um there's another one kind of about looking for it uh what time will it be over orion or can we use orion as a good point for where it is um not really for tonight but the first one happens it's going to be too early for you to really be able to see Orion well um, and it's going to be pretty much overhead whereas Orion as I'm about to talk about it a little bit in a, in a moment is over here in sort of the southern part of the sky and for this second pass you can see actually where it's going to disappear Whoop. fast forward to time way too much um, the second one is going to be setting before it even reaches Orion. So Orion's not a great marker for these particular passes. But again, um, it's kind of hard to miss because it is such a bright object and it's so clearly moving. Um, I don't usually need a, a marker to find it. It's usually pretty easy to spot. So like I said, third brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon, even brighter than the planet Venus. Awesome. Um, and if you have time for another question before we move that. on, I, <laughs> I know you could talk about ISS for a while. I really could. <laughs> um, Victoria, a third grader is wondering how big is it? It's often compared in size to an American football field. So uh, particularly appropriate this weekend with the Super Bowl coming up. That's not the living area. That's the entire station, along with its massive solar panels from which it gets its energy. Uh, the living area is much tighter. It's really sort of two basic long tubes with a couple of attachments um, coming off of it. It's, it's not, you know, a ton of space, but one of the great things about the space station is that there's no ceiling or floor, so you can really use all of the surface areas as storage space which means they've got these long stretches down the middle that uh, it's fun. You can spot, um, you can find videos of astronauts just like supermanning their way down the main part of the space station. Which looks like sounds like it might be fun. <laughs> um, and one more question about looking for it. Uh, will, will we be able to see it tomorrow um, in the morning at all? Uh, I don't think we're going to see it in the morning tomorrow. I do know there's going to be an evening pass tomorrow. I think there's only one. I think it's around six, maybe at 530 again. Um, again, I cannot recommend spot the station enough if you really want to go out and find the ISS. I know there is an evening pass tomorrow, though. So like I said, this isn't an every night kind of deal, but it's not a rare thing to be able to go out and spot the space station. It's really cool though. I always wave in case the astronauts are looking. I'm sure they right. can see you from down there. Yeah, I, I like to pretend. <laughs> All right, so now we are looking at this Southern sky and we can see um, 
some familiar constellations, especially the constellation Orion over here. We do have a planet visible um, because we were talking about planets before. This bright red object right here is a planet. And if you were gonna guess what planet it was, just based on the color, what planet would you guess that it was? All right, so if you have any guesses, uh, you can type them in. We have quite a few guesses coming in and pretty much all of them are saying Mars, some with question marks. Yes, that is the planet Mars. Uh, and you can see it is brighter than the thing. It's a bright object. It will have a noticeably reddish tint if you look at it in the night sky. Um, it's not gonna be, you know, blood red or anything, but it is a, does have a reddish color to it, which you can see. Um, and it's going to be well-placed for viewing throughout the month of February. So don't worry if these clouds don't clear up and you don't see it tonight, it's gonna be well-placed for viewing all month, which is great because this really is Mars month. I am so excited. There's a lot going on with Mars in the coming weeks. Um, if you remember all the way back to July, there were three different spacecraft that launched on their way to Mars and they are all arriving in the next two weeks. Uh, so we have one arriving next on Tuesday, Tuesday morning, I think around 10 a.m. mid-morning. Uh, the first Mars mission from the United Arab Emirates is going to enter Martian orbit. Uh, that spacecraft is called HOPE. The next day, Wednesday, the 10th, uh, the first Chinese Mars mission is going to enter orbit. And then on the 18th, the following Thursday, the new NASA rover, Perseverance, is not going to enter orbit. It's going to go all the way down to the surface. Um, so we've got a lot of Mars stuff going on in the next couple of weeks. And if you're interested in hearing more, we've got Mars programming happening all month. So check out uh, some of the live streams we have coming up in the next couple of weeks, especially our Tuesday Exploring Space ones. We're gonna be focusing on Mars all month. So that is what a planet looks like in the sky. It looks very similar to a star. Um, and it's usually the ones you can see with your eyes and without a telescope are quite bright, but of course it's not a star because there are a lot of cool things up in space that are not stars. There's a lot of stuff up there that we call deep sky objects. It's pretty much anything that's not just a star would sort of qualify or a planet would qualify as a deep sky object. A lot of these are very faint. Some of them are very hard to see, but some you can see with just your eyes, including a couple that we can see um, with just our eyes here in the winter sky. So the constellation Orion has come up tonight. It's right over here tonight, today. It's also up tonight, um, marked by his belt of three bright stars right in a row. And it just happens to look like they're in a row. It turns out these two stars here on the ends are actually much closer to earth than the star in the middle. The star in the middle is actually a lot brighter as well. It's just farther away. So they look very similar to each other from where we are here on the earth. And I'll go ahead and put the stick figure for that constellation up there. This is Orion, the mighty hunter. You can see he's got his club up there. He's ready to go. Uh, a lot of people's favorite constellation because that belt is very distinctive, um, pretty easy to spot in the sky. And then right next to him in the sky is this V shape which is marked at one end by the bright star Aldebaran. Uh, and this is Orion's opponent. This is who he's, why he's got his club raised. This is the constellation Taurus the Bull. These two are sort of the anchor for the winter sky. Their ongoing battle is what uh, is sort of at the center of the winter constellations. And they each have a few interesting deep sky objects in them some of which you can just see with your eyes. You don't need binoculars or a telescope to see. And like I said, deep sky objects can refer to a couple of things. It can be a star cluster, it can be a nebula, a galaxy, anything that's really outside of our solar system that's not a star would qualify really as a deep sky object. One of the most famous is in the constellation Orion. It's 
right here in his sheath where he keeps his sword when he's not using it. You can actually zoom in and here and we can see it right there. And what this is, um, if you look at it with your eyes, it'll look like kind of a fuzzy star. If you look at it with binoculars, it will be kind of a fuzzy patch of space. And then if you look at it through like a really big telescope, and if you look at it with a really fancy telescope, like say the Hubble Space Telescope, this is what you might see. This is the Orion Nebula, also called the Great Nebula in Orion, because astronomers are not always creative. Uh, and what this is, is this is a place where stars are being born, a stellar nursery, often called a star birth nebula or a star forming nebula. So this is a place where it's not just a giant cloud of gas, it's actually a place where stars are being formed out of that gas. It's the kind of place our sun would have originally formed several billion years ago. And it's the closest star forming region to the earth. It's several hundred light years away, but it is the closest place to earth where stars are actively being born. And it is visible in the constellation Orion. So just look under his belt for the three stars that mark, uh, mark his sheath or his scabbard here and look for the one in the center. It's a little bit fuzzy if you look at it with your eyes. And that's because it's a nebula, not a star. So the stars being born out of that nebula, they're actually eating the nebula up as they're being born because they're being made out of the gases of the nebula. So when the nebula is gone, what's left are the stars themselves. Uh, and what that looks like is visible in actually two different places in Taurus the bull. So as a reminder, again, here is Taurus. Here's this V shape marks his face. And then he's got this interesting thing going on over here, which is sometimes considered to be a wound in the bull's shoulder, like Orion got a hit in, um, but it has its own name. We call it the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. And I've been told it looks like a little, 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 little dipper. And I can see where that comes from. And what this is, is a star cluster. And it's another thing that the eye tends to be drawn to, just like the eye tends to be drawn to Orion's belt because it's a straight line. And you don't really see straight lines much when you look up at this night sky. It, the eye tends to be drawn to the Pleiades because of the tight clustering of stars. It, it's noticeable. So this is what you would see when you look at it with your eyes, a little tight cluster of not actually seven visible stars. You can really only see six if you look with your eyes. Through binoculars, you might be able to see a couple of dozen stars. And again, when you zoom in a lot, there's actually hundreds of stars in this cluster. Uh, so this is what a big telescope like Hubble might see when it looks at it. You can actually see the little bit of remnants of the nebula those wisps of gas, that's all that's left of the nebula that gave birth to these stars. And again, once upon a time, our sun would have belonged to a cluster like this, um, surrounded by its siblings. It's just that over the last 5 billion years or so, that cluster has fallen apart. It's the stars in it have spread out. So we're not 100% sure where the sun's siblings are. And that's another indication that this is a very young cluster because these stars are still pretty close together. Now I mentioned it's called the Seven Sisters, even though you can't see seven stars. That's, there's kind of an interesting theory about that because that's not just a Greek thing. As far away as the legends of Aboriginal Australians, this is seven female figures. And that suggests that the idea of this cluster of stars representing seven people, and usually seven females, is a very, very, very old one. Many, 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 many thousands and tens of thousands, maybe even a hundred thousand years old. And if you go back that far in time, two of the stars in the cluster that you really can't tell apart with your eyes anymore were a little bit farther apart and may have been visible which means you would have been able to see seven distinct stars. So we think the idea of this being seven figures is 
an extremely old one. It goes back to uh, really the almost the origins of humans looking up at the sky and making up names for things. And if you want to see another star cluster, there's actually another one very, very, very close by in the sky. It's just not as distinctive. <coughs> Excuse me. It's actually Taurus's face. Taurus's face is also a star cluster. It doesn't look as tight as the Pleiades because it's spread out a lot more and it doesn't have as many stars in it. But we, this is a star cluster called the Hyades. So you've got the Pleiades and the Hyades. This is a much more spread out cluster. Uh, but this one is actually closer to Earth. So the face of Taurus the bull is actually another star cluster, which is not as well known as the fact that the Pleiades is a star cluster. So those are a couple of deep sky objects and a couple of constellations that you can spot, as well as a planet, that you can spot in the night sky the next clear night, probably not tonight, but looks like tomorrow is going to be a clear night. Look to the southern sky to spot Orion's belt and look below the belt for the Orion Nebula. <clears throat> and look next to Orion for the V shape of Taurus's face. And you all found the Hyades star cluster. And keep going to find the little cluster that is the Pleiades star cluster, the seven sisters. And we're starting to run out of time. Becca, are there any other questions that have come in that I can answer before we end? Sure, there are a few. And kind of going along with what you're talking about just now with all these constellations and star clusters, Nora is wondering, how do constellations form? That is a great question. So um, constellations are just patterns that we make up. So it was very, very common in ancient times for people to look up at the stars and to make shapes out of those stars. It seems to have been a common practice uh, for groups of people from all over the world. And if this theory about the Pleiades being extremely old is true, it means we've been doing it really since Homo sapiens became a species. Uh, and different people see completely different things. So to us, you know, Orion is Orion the hunter, but I also know it's, uh, it's a, a hearth or um, it's a turtle or it's the hero Gilgamesh. It really depends, uh, different cultures see different things. So if you go outside and look at a pattern of stars and say, hey, I think that looks like a bird, you've just made up your own constellation. As for how the stars get into those patterns, um, the stars are actually moving. All these stars are moving. They're just moving because they're moving through the Milky Way galaxy. They're just moving very, very, very slowly on human time scales, which means, you know, if you were to go a million years in the future, these star patterns as we know them wouldn't exist anymore, even a few tens of thousands of years into the future. They wouldn't exist anymore. The stars would have moved into different positions. So uh, this is just really the way they've looked for the last couple thousand years, which is when most of the constellations that we use today were made up. Awesome. And one last question before we end is uh, how many star clusters are there from Anders? Oh, a lot. Most of them you cannot see with your eyes. Um, you would need binoculars or a telescope to see, but I'm wondering if I can, like, for instance, nope, that's the wrong constellation. Yeah, so like over here, there's a star cluster. There's another one right there. This is the beehive cluster. Um, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and turn something on that I usually leave off because it's chaotic. These are all deep sky objects, <laughs> most of which you can't see, but you see how often the word cluster pops up. These are all star clusters. The one I was just showing you is the beehive. Um, there are star clusters all over the place. They're actually a very, very common thing. And I have no idea how many there are. The answer is a large number. Awesome. Thanks for that. And I know we still have some more questions, but unfortunately we are out of time. So I'm going to invite Talia to say your goodbyes.
Awesome. And thank you uh, for answering all these questions today. And thank you everyone else for your great questions and your observation throughout the presentation. If you enjoyed this program and would like to see more of our virtual offerings, you can head to uh, mos.org slash mos at home. And if you enjoyed this program and are able and willing to support the uh, this program and all of the museum programs, you can go to engage.mos.org slash welcome. And this program was produced using Solarium. So if you want to go try it out yourself, you can head to www.solarium.org. It's pretty fun. So hopefully you get to enjoy it yourself. Once again, thank you all very much for being here today and enjoy the rest of your day.